Welcome to this installment of Supplemental Lectures provided by PNC's Concurrent Enrollment Program. My name is Alexandra Kendall and I wish to share some information with you that comes out of my history courses at Purdue University North Central. Today we will discuss the type of sources that historians use as a part of their work and also how to cite them. Identifying sources and understanding their different roles in creating history is important as a student as well as a professional historian. Scholars use a variety of sources in developing historiography and in creating a usable past for each generation. Since the past cannot be recreated, we must understand the times that have passed as best we can. We utilize sources to answer the questions we have about the past, which can inform us about our present too. For instance, we can look at the role of women prior to the Civil War to understand how certain ideas such as true womanhood and domesticity linger into p later periods, including our present time. In the course of revisiting the past, scholars create a history of historical ideas which can be called historiography. The meaning that 1950 scholars looked for about women's roles was far different than what we might look for now. Before we go much farther, we should discuss the kind of sources historians use. As a part of an AP course or a college level course, you will come in contact with these sources directly and indirectly. For our purposes, I have divided sources into four categories, primary sources, secondary sources, tertiary sources, and forbidden sources. Dun, dun, dun. For scholars, the first two are the most important, but as high school students, you will need to learn the value of these sources and why other sources are not as reliable. This will be knowledge you can take with you into your college career. Also note that there is no mention of print media versus digital media on this list. When you assess sources, the delivery system is less important than other factors. There are good sources on the web, as there are in libraries. The same holds true for not so reliable sources. More than where you actually obtain your source, the following criteria are the most important aspects in assessing the usability or value of your source. You should be able to identify a source by its author or authors. This includes his or her name, title, and role as author. A, histori a historian writing about mathematics is a terrible source for understanding math, but a mathematician writing about her experiences on a college campus during the 1970s could tell a reader a lot about the feminist movement as a participant. In addition to knowing who is speaking, writing, or providing visual sources, it is important for a researcher to know who the audience for the source is. For example, propaganda posters for World War I are most, mostly directed at young men of draft age, women who needed to conserve food, or other Americans who might buy war stamps. Woodrow Wilson made many speeches. Some were to Congress while some of his messages were meant to be heard by the world. Assessing the audience can help an author understand the significance of the source. Who published this source? In the case of reliable histories, university presses offer readers a guarantee that their books are peer-reviewed. Independent pressers offer a freedom of expression that might not be possible in traditional academia. This puts more of a burden on the reader, however, to check from where the author got his material. In terms of primary sources, there are a variety of things a student of history can look for during the research process. Finally, the date is important in assessing what kind of source it is. Now that we laid down these categories, let's jump into the types of sources more specifically. Let's start at the beginning. Primary sources are sources that are produced by people who experience the event. This is why dates of publication are important. Upton Sinclair's The Jungle was published in 1906. His book can give us insight into the problems of immigrants in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, the hazards of factories, and the rise of socialism prior to World War I. In looking at the other categories of assessing sources, we can refine our understanding of the source even better. Who was Sinclair? An author, a socialist leader, a true believer. Who was his audience? His intended audience was workers who Sinclair thought would see the value of socialism in fighting a hurtful system of capitalism. This tells us a lot about society because despite the fact that his authorship and audience were intended to be these proto-socialists, Americans responded by being horrified about their food sources. Congress, of course, passed legislation to protect consumers and there was not a socialist revolt to overthrow capitalism. One could argue Americans were too committed to capitalism and were willing to embark on a major reform movement instead. Could Sinclair have over-exaggerated parts of the book? Maybe, since he was not there to uh, objectively describe work in a meatpacking plant or life in an ethnic community. 
So other sources such as reports, eyewitness accounts, and photographs can help us see the truth in Sinclair's accounts, or in, on the converse, the parts that he over-exaggerated. Thus, while Sinclair's book was a primary source, so would be the other sources mentioned. There are a wide variety of sources that can be used to see a topic from a variety of angles. Some of these are available online, such as Sinclair's book and images from industrial life in the Progressive Era. Others are only available in libraries or archives. In the 21st century, we are lucky to have access to a good number of sources online, but many letters, diaries, and journals are too fragile to scan, nor are all of them useful to a majority of the population. So for most, uh, most high school and undergraduate research papers, the sources in local libraries or online will provide you with what you need. Primary sources provide perspective and color for your work. Newspapers can also provide you with information, but so can everyday and seemingly boring sources such as pamphlets or business ledgers. Government sources tell us much about what politicians were doing in their time. While you might not use these sources to write your papers, you should know that they are sources that historians might use in writing their books and articles. You can see their sources in the bibliography and footnotes provided by the historian. Objects from the time period being studied can also be considered primary sources. This might include ceremonial items, campaign buttons, or even clothing. People liked stuff then and now. Some people even like to have stuff from the past. Pickers, antiquers, and museum curators collect items from the past to use or display. Check out the website of the Ephemera Society of America to see what items interest them. When I teach women's history, I often bring one of my flat, old flat irons so that students can feel the weight of it. In the mid-19th century, as the U.S. began to urbanize, ideas about women defined them as physically weaker than men. I bring the iron as an object lesson between ideas and reality. A 19th century rural woman washed all the family's clothes by hand, ironed them for comfort, hauled wood and water to make the uh, laundry day possible, made cheese with a hand churn. These were all very physically difficult tasks. The iron represents the physicality of rural life that changed for women as they moved into the cities and became consumers more than producers. One last category deserves special attention. Memoirs and autobiographies can be a little tricky in identifying the time period and because they rely on the more distant memories of the creators. Witnesses are notoriously inaccurate. Ask a policeman or any investigator. But for those who wait to write their accounts later in life, the witness, witnesses to history have lost some of the vividness of their memories and also have been influenced by what they have read since the event occurred. Ulysses S. Grant wrote his memoirs before his death. Surely his perspectives about the Civil War were different after seeing the failures of Reconstruction. Historians balance all of these issues as they write their narratives of the past. When you read about history from historians, you are reading a secondary source. The lion's share of secondary sources come in the form of books and articles. These take years of research, writing, and editing to get published. Historians go to archives, order sources through libraries, and use both primary and secondary sources to produce their manuscripts. Historical art articles are sponsored by societies and organizations, often hosted at universities. My first peer-reviewed article was published in the American 19th Century History Journal. While this article can be accessed online, it is a reliable journal with both print and online formats. It is a peer-reviewed journal. This is not a web page, but a source available via the web. In the case of my article, the editors who accepted the article for publication first read the article, then sent it to two historians who had knowledge of my subject. The editors then read those reviews and sent me recommendations to revise the article. The reviewers recommended that I add more detail about certain individuals. They decided that my ideas were good and added to the historical conversation about antebellum America, yet they had a few questions that needed to be answered. I wrote that material in and my article got edited for syntax, grammar, and for format. This took time and commitment, for which I did not get paid nor did the reviewers. We all perform these services to help expand our understanding of the past. In order to make this process as objective as possible, the reviewer did not know who the author was, nor did I get to know who made the recommendations to me about my paper. So far we have seen how authorship and publication sources can tell us about how to use primary and secondary sources, but there are also sources that students use that do not fall into these two categories. College history professors at times use the term tertiary sources to identify them. These are sources that do not necessarily produce new ideas, but are designed to give readers a basic understanding. 
encyclopedias and textbooks are tertiary sources in which their authors synthesize the current understanding of history in a generalized way. I have edited two sets of encyclopedias in the last 10 years, and it requires a different approach than writing peer-reviewed sources such as books and articles. As an author of an article, I use primary and secondary sources to help me bring new ideas to the forefront. As an encyclopedia editor, I asked authors to write about topics that they knew well, but write up the basic facts and their significance. No new ideas, no primary sources. These types of sources often focus on the who, what, where, and when of their topics. With the growth of the web, there are kinds of new sources that we did not have when I was in high school or college. The web provides good and bad tertiary sources as well. Not all online encyclopedias are bad. The Texas State Historical Society put together a great online resource. So does the Economic History Society. Note how upfront the page is about who wrote the entry and who produced it. Authorship is clear and a reader can investigate who is behind the work. Let's compare these well-sponsored web-based encyclopedias to a personal web page on a historical topic. Certain events attract history buffs who love to talk about their topics. The Civil War is one of those, so in looking for a poor source, I only had to Google one topic to find such a source. While the material on this site seems pretty good and the page creator provided a bibliography, I would not accept this as a legitimate source for a research paper in one of my college classes. Without serious training, at best, the author will be overly focused on facts. At its worst, a web page such as this can be wholly inaccurate. This author did us a kind service by describing his background. Note that he is not a trained historian, but he writes about the topic because he is interested. Peer-reviewed books and articles allow readers to, to uh, get facts and see, see the facts, but also significance uh, from, from trained scholars and their points of view. Web pages are just plain unreliable. I would consider Mr. Jenkins' web page a forbidden source. Dun dun dun. This is a term I am just using for this lecture, this forbidden source. But college professors do grade papers based on the sources used. Papers with poor sources get poor grades. Some professors even list pages that should not be used. That's one of the purposes of the syllabus. The most forbidden of forbidden sources, of course, is Wikipedia. Don't get me wrong, I will look at a Wikipedia entry when I want some basic information, but not to write a history paper. Why? Because if we, as we have discussed today, authorship matters. Who can write for Wikipedia? Anybody. Let's go back to the Economic History Encyclopedia I showed you earlier. This page allows you to see who sponsors the project, who the editors are, and who wrote the entry. There's no way for users to edit the page. This is not so with Wikipedia. Not only can anyone write for it, people even vandalize the pages. There are those that just enjoy messing with the pages, but some folks try to rewrite the entries to fit their agendas. The folks at Wikipedia have done a great job editing their entries and backing them up, backing them up in case of vandalism, but the plain truth is it is not a good source for writing papers. Most tertiary source, sources aren't. Textbooks and encyclopedias are good for learning the basic material before doing research. They should be treated as such. Wikipedia is not the only forbidden source in my class. I generally find that non-academic sources don't provide the meat students need to write good papers. Also, when looking for accurate and useful information, the author and the publisher do matter. Choosing your sources for a paper or understanding how ideas are created are only part of the equation for academics. Citation of those sources are just as important for a variety of reasons. If I came to your house and stole your TV, you would, without a doubt, protest. You might call the police. You would cl complain loudly to your friends about the jerk who stole your TV, right? Well, you cannot touch an idea, yet it is just as much property as is your TV. Authors do a lot of work to do research and write for often little or no pay depending on the type of the material. The federal government under copyright law protects authors and their intellectual property. When someone uses their words or their ideas without a citation, it is theft and we call that plagiarism. Authors take plagiarism far more seriously than do most people, but there are consequences for plagiarism. 
In the 1990s, singer-songwriter Sarah McLachlan was sued by one of her stalkers for writing a song about his letters to her without attribution. Like any other criminal offense, stealing of intellectual property can end up in a lawsuit. Now, most students who plagiarize material don't go to court, and often there are no sanctions. But in college, there are sanctions. In my syllabus, it states that the penalty uh, for plagiarism is an F for the course, and the student will then be reported to the dean of students. On our campus, and on many college campuses, deans will take these reports and put them in student files. If a student is reported one time at PNC, the student is called in to meet with the dean to discuss the seriousness of the issue. If several incidences are reported, a student can face university sanctions, including expulsion. Yes, you can be expelled from college. The consequences are real. In most publications, historians use footnotes for citation. When a historian uses the exact wording of an author or from a primary source, she must put those words in quotation marks and then provide information about that source. A good scholar also provides an in-text citation. For example, instead of just quoting the material, the historian might write something like this, as historian Richard White notes, and then continue with the quotation. This gives the reader a better understanding of why the quote is important. From a primary source, it might read like this. In the Progressive Era, reformers were both men and women and worried about the fate of factory workers. One female reformer observed that, and then proceed with quote. Not only does this make your material more sparkly, but it also adds to your word count. Every type of citation method has a manual, a big book, lots of rules. Historians use the Chicago Manual of Style. Most of you will not need that many rules, even in college. So Kate Tarabian did the world a favor by condensing the most important rules for her students in her book. When I was in college, we referred to her manual for writers just as Tarabian. As a professional writer and editor, I'm forced to own copies of the full manual. The web and computers also have made this easier. Some word processing programs will create your citations for you, and there are numerous websites to help, including citationmachine.com and then also the Purdue OWL, which is a site from Purdue and West Lafayette. And uh, Purdue provides a useful page with major citation styles, including Chicago. But in order to use any of these helpers, you'll still need to gather the information needed for the metadata prompts. Here you can see a list of the information needed in the order of a footnote citation. The goal of the citation, and this is important, the goal of the citation is to give the reader a location for your material that you borrowed for your, for your paper. So if a reader wanted to read that material, he could find the book and do his own research. If you are quoting, it is important to include a page number. A reader should not be expected to look through the whole book or a whole web page for that matter, but look through a whole book to find a quote. When I was working on my master's thesis, this was important. As scholars referenced the First Commissioner of Agriculture in their books, I needed to find their sources so I could check the footnotes and hunt down the original sources. When I found the original sources, I was able to get more information for my thesis. A footnote must be useful. Also, since authors are real people like me, citing accurately respects the work of the people who sacrifice time with their families to write these works. If you are citing a book, you will need its title. We generally italicize these or underline them when writing. Putting quotation marks around them is incorrect. If you are citing a particular chapter or a journal article, their titles are put in quotation marks. The book or journal titles are then italicized. While this seems like nitpicking, these are the rules. Life is full of rules. Showing that you know how to follow various rules will demonstrate to instructors that you are aware and conscientious. We love both of these. After the author and title, you will need to identify the publication information. For a trained reader, this tells her how to find a book specifically and what kind of source it is. She will know from the date and publisher if it is a peer-reviewed book or a primary source. And thus, with a quick glance, a trained reader can determine the type and quality of your research. There are ways to indicate missing information, but you as the writer should attempt to get as much information as possible. So let's take a closer look at a footnote. To make this a fair example, I picked up a book randomly off one of my shelves. I have not read this book, but let's see how much information I can get out of the book. In order to demonstrate good citation style, I provided a little bit of prose and a quote for us to examine. First, 
I introduced the author, I quote it, so that you knew it was not an observer from the time period. So this is more of a secondary source than a primary source. Since authors are people and books don't write themselves, a good sentence should be an active voice. A person doing a thing. Passive voice is weak. Writers using active voice create sparkly prose that readers want to read. Not only did I let the reader know who wrote the words I quoted, I gave a little introduction to the quote to set the stage. Drama. Context. Readers love to get pulled into the story. After setting the stage, I quoted the material. Everything within the quotation marks is, is, is exactly as seen in the text except for the quoted material within the quote. A quote within a quote. I have not changed any words, punctuation, or formatting except for the quotation marks. Finally, let's get to the footnote. I indicated the material being cited by putting a superscript number after the quote. Sometimes you will see books with one footnote or end note per paragraph. Publishers do this to save money by saving space and time editing. Then at the foot of the page, my note gives the source information. And of course, don't forget the page number. This and some punctuation is the difference between a footnote and an entry in a bi bibliography. A bibliography is just a list of sources referenced generally when putting together a paper, while the author then uses footnotes to indicate the sources relied upon specifically for, for ideas, facts, or quotes. With all that said, let's take a good writing interlude. This lecture is about sources and citations, but in the end, the goal is to write a good paper. Writers who read good works have a better chance of writing a good paper, and no one really wants to defeat all that work by failing to cite. But taking all this together, good sources, good citations, and good writing go hand in hand. An underlying point of this lecture is that authors write books. Scholars create ideas. If I were to say this passively, it would sound like this. Books are written. Ideas are created. Note that the verb is the same. Boring. Totally boring. As a grader of term papers and AP essays, yes, I do that too, I am likely to give a higher grade to a writer whose essays are written in the active voice because they are clear and far more enjoyable to read. For those of you who have had a hard time filling up the page or making your word count, writing in active voice also means more words. So the key to active voice is putting people into your prose. Those people sometimes have names. When you don't know their names, you can still identify them with purpose. Reformers, administrators, officials, policemen, judges, presidents, congressmen, women, husbands, family members, Americans, immigrants, city dwellers, automobile drivers, and so on. There are so many ways to indicate people of whom you do not know their names. Let's look at our last example and turn it into passive voice. So here is the quote I used with the in-text citation and explanation of the quote. 89 words. Here is a passive version written as many freshmen might write the same statement. Nine words. I rest my case. How do you avoid passive voice? Avoid was. Even though this sentence starts with a person, the verb is a hint that the sentence might be passive. Who is the person performing the action? Chief Justice Taney. So if we turn it around, Taney becomes the person. In 1861, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney inaugurated Abraham Lincoln as the 16th President of the United States. More than nine words. We also got a sparkly verb, inaugurated instead of was. Overall, the benefits of citation and writing an active voice are worth the time. If you practice these now while in high school, they will become easier over time and by college you will have fewer problems writing essays in class or papers at home. So to conclude the lecture, I want to remind you about citations. While it is best to cite your sources properly, it is better to cite inc incorrectly than not at all. It is also better to cite bad sources than, than to pretend you didn't use them. It is important that students know that instructors in your high schools and colleges are smart people. We can find plagiarism. We have programs such as SafeAssign and Turnitin.com, but we also have a powerful weapon, the Google. As easy as it is for you to find a source, it is as easy for me to check your work. Instructors know how their students write and how scholars write, so whenever I come across something that sounds just plain wrong in some manner, I just put it into the Google. The Google knows all and tells all. 
Most of the plagiarism that I catch is just by reading student papers and checking suspect phrasing. It is that easy. So in regards to plagiarism, I will quote the great philosopher Grandmaster Flash. Don't do it. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this information will help you in your studies. We all hope to see you at PNC when you are done with your high school degree.